It is uh, 1215 and just want to welcome everyone. My name is uh, Dr. Melissa Stiles and I'm the Director of Faculty Development for the Department of Family Medicine and Community Health here. I'm uh, so glad you all can join us. For, uh, this is uh, going to be a wonderful session and I am very happy to introduce our three panelists uh, for day, today that will focus on uh, long haul COVID. So starting with our own um, uh, Dr. Sharina Schrager, uh, is a professor in our department, um, has been at Northeast Clinic uh, for just a few years, uh, joined us in 1996. Um, and she is a special ex expertise in uh, women's health and practice-based research. Um, she's an accomplished uh, scholar and writer, publisher of over 100 PubMed articles, editor of both books and journals, currently serving as the editor-in-chief of both the Wisconsin Medical Journal and Family Practice Management. Uh, she's the current director of our department's mentoring and promotion program, and also the director of our Wisconsin Research and Education Network, um, the medical director, and has worked on a number of projects, um, including this one. Um, so happy also to have Dr. Rachel Grubb with us, who has her doctorate um, background is in sociology, um, is a longtime uh, collaborator with many projects um, in our department. Her research interests include um, patient experiences with healthcare, inclusion of the patient experience, measures in public reporting, and how the patient uh, voice influences health policy. Um, she has uh, secured many public and private grants uh, regarding this work um, and is also on, on national committees, including the National Quality Forums Task Force on Patient and Family-Centered Care. So thanks for joining us. And also, um, uh, Dr. Jane Everett, thank you for coming. Um, she is um, one of our primary care research fellows, um, is an accomplished uh, nurse and nurse scientist who's passionate about relational care and qualitative experiences approaches to inquiry. Um, she uh, did her doctorate at University of Pennsylvania after doing an accelerated nursing degree there. Um, and during her fellowship, um, she strives to pursue research and advocacy collaborations that work towards improving person, family, friend, and clinician experiences of health and healthcare. And so that brings us all together. And um, we Please put questions in the chat as we go. Um, we'll have uh, time for questions at the end. So thank you, Serena, for leading us off. Thank you, Melissa, for um, those lovely introductions. Um, I am going to start, and just to give people a little bit of an orientation, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the clinical aspects of long COVID. Um, then Jane and Rachel are going to present um, data and some findings from a study that um, they worked on in collaboration with Wren. And then we're going to kind of circle back at the end to talk about, you know, with what we've learned from this study, how we as primary care clinicians can um, best impact our patients with long COVID and help them. Um, okay. So um, also just one caveat, um, I, I am not an expert in this condition. And the reason that I say that is that none of us are experts in this condition. There really is um, a very little known about it. As we know, you know, COVID's been around for two years. Long COVID has really been recognized in the very recent past. And we are seeing, um, you know, study after study coming out about um, reasons behind long COVID risk factors, we don't have a lot of great treatment. So um, kind of in the back of your minds, um, think about the way I'm thinking about this syndrome of long COVID or long haul COVID is similar to um, many other syndromes we have and we treat people with where we have unexplained symptoms, multiple organs involved, no diagnostic tests, no direct treatment. So what we end up doing is focusing on symptoms and managing relationships. Um, okay, so that said, let's just start out with a, a case because I always find it's helpful to have a real person 
in your mind when you're talking about the science. So this is Valerie. She's 54. She has a history of um, diet controlled diabetes and a um, well controlled hypertension. Her BMI is 28. She presents with the complaint of fatigue and brain fog for the last two months. She was diagnosed with COVID about three months ago and her acute illness was relatively minimal. She had um, a, a minimal respiratory symptoms um, and she had loss of taste and smell. Um, uh, her smell actually and taste have not come back completely and so she just hasn't really been interested in eating. Um, she has no respiratory symptoms, but having trouble at work due to difficulty concentrating and lack of energy and fatigue. Um, so pretty typical person that we're seeing a lot. Um, next slide, please. So long COVID or long haul COVID or the you know fancy scientific name is now PASC, post acute sequelae of COVID. You will see that in the literature. Um, the World Health Organization has a de um, definition. They say long haul COVID or long COVID occurs in individuals who have a history of probable or confirmed SARS-CoV-2 infection. Usually um, they're three months from the onset of COVID-19 with symptoms that last for at least two months and cannot be explained by an alternate diagnosis. So basically, symptoms that are lingering for more than two to three months, and we don't have another reason to explain them. Okay, next slide, please. So I kind of like this slide because it's sort of overwhelming, and I feel like the image um, gives you a, a, a good sort of pictorial um, explanation of what um, this virus can do. It can affect almost any organ system, and as we see, any of these organ systems that are affected in acute infection can also be affected in the long haul infections. You know, when we're starting to see um, a, a recent study looking at increased coronary artery disease, increased cardiovascular complications up to a year after a COVID infection, we see lots of people with cough and um, lots of people with brain fog and fatigue. Um, okay, next slide. The most common symptoms that we see in patients diagnosed with long COVID include these listed here. I would say in my practice, the things I'm seeing are fatigue, brain fog, um, palpitations, this sort of vague chest pain, um, and then the loss of smell and taste. But um, any of these others are certainly common. Um, okay, next slide. So the prevalence is sort of hard to determine, um, partly because some people will have had COVID without a formal diagnosis. Many people don't present to the healthcare um, system. But estimates are 5 to 20% of people that have symptoms for at least more than four weeks. Um, uh, risk factors for having long COVID include pre-infection comorbidities like type 2 diabetes, severity of illness, and vaccination appears to be protective, but there aren't great studies looking at that. Um, there was a recent Dutch study that followed um, people who were admitted to the ICU with COVID. Um, there were like 245 people in their study and they followed them for a year. And they found that e even at a year post hospitalization, almost three quarters had some type of physical symptoms and about 16% had cognitive symptoms. So the physical symptoms people had were weakness, fatigue, joint pains, um, but that's a pretty high, um, pretty high number illustrating that, you know, people with severe infection have a higher rate of long COVID symptoms. People with mild infection have lower rates. Um, okay, next, next slide. Um, okay, so one recent study that everybody's been talking about, and I put the citation here that was in the um, journal Cell, looked at um, people with post-acute sequelae of COVID and compared them um, based on risk factors that were 
measured at their initial, the an onset of their diagnosis, if that makes sense. They followed 300 people and they did all these tests when people were first diagnosed and then um, were able to compare that cohort of people with long COVID to people who had the original acute infection but didn't have um, these long-term symptoms. And they found, the results they found were pretty significant. They found that people with long COVID were more likely to have type 2 diabetes. Um, uh, people ended up with long COVID if they had more SARS-CoV-2 viremia. Um, uh, the other one that's sort of re really interesting is that people who had Epstein-Barr virus viremia at the initial diagnosis had longer term symptoms. And then there were specific autoantibodies that they measured to the COVID infection that ended up being correlated with long-term symptoms. I think this is one of the reasons that a lot of people are thinking that the mechanism um, for long COVID is similar to a fibromyalgia or chronic fatigue, is this idea of the you know, concomitant EBV infection. Um, so it's actually, it's, there are some biologic plausibility um, explanations, but we don't know for sure what's causing what. Um, okay, next slide. I think over to Jane. Good. Thank you so much, Serena, for kind of orienting us to some of the emerging biomedical knowledge around this novel condition. We also know that patient and communities have been feeling long COVID's impact for a long time and have just sort of sprung into action in support communities to mobilize around this issue, um, which really makes patient experience at the heart of defining and, and describing long COVID as it has been with other like conditions like fibromyalgia and chronic fatigue, some of, of the conditions that Serena mentioned. Um, and we, we know that primary care is often a touch point for people with these conditions, and it's been suggested that primary care, again, will be central in how we respond to long COVID, particularly with its capacity for providing long-term relational care to people who are suffering. So our team in collaboration with REN was very fortunate to receive a Department of Family Medicine small grant to start looking at actionable targets within people's lived experience narratives. And we were particularly interested in dimensions of trust, so trust in systems and information and healthcare providers, um, people's trust in themselves, and you'll see that reflected in some of what we'll share today. We situate our work in syndemics in social epidemiology, which suggests that health inequities emerge from multiple social factors and medical conditions. And so we really conceptualize a person's health with long COVID as embedded within and influenced by these different levels of so an interpersonal, clinical, community, organizational, and policy dynamics which means that we're thinking about lived experiences both informing long COVID responses and then those responses in turn informing um, lived experiences of people who are living with long COVID. For this project and, and in a lot of our health experiences work, we use database of individual patient experience methodology, which just briefly is an internationally vetted qualitative method to really deeply understand people's experiences. We elicit heterogeneous perspectives, seeking especially lesser heard voices, synthesize those with attention to both theme and variation, and then amplify what we hear to make care systems and support systems work better for patients. We also just want to point out, as we all know, that illness happens in the community and there are many potential patients um, and people suffering with long COVID who may not be seeking care. And we were particularly interested in, in learning about their perspectives and experiences as well. So just a brief snapshot of some of the people that we've spoken to. Um, you can see breakdowns here by insurance status, age, race, ethnicity, gender, and sexual orientation. And then we want to share a, a couple of clips from these interviews in a montage that is about 10 minutes. Um, so you'll hear from a variety of different people and then we will um, sort of pick that up as we talk through some of what we've heard. Jennifer was diagnosed with COVID in 2020. She's a white woman in her late 40s, lives in a small urban city in the Midwest with her family, and works as a healthcare provider. Jennifer continues to experience symptoms following COVID, including heart issues, brain fog, and fatigue. 
Her life has changed drastically as a result. Here, she speaks about the lasting effect COVID has had on her cognitive functioning. The uncertainty is hard. It's hard. Yeah. I want to know. I'm, I, you know, I want to know that I'm going to get my taste and smell back. I want to know that it's going to be okay. That it's going to, that my brain's going to get back into shape. Um, it's the cognitive stuff is, is the worst part of this. Yeah. Yeah, because I didn't used to lose my train of thought like this. I mean, I did every once in a while. I think it's normal, but now I just, yeah, I I can't keep focused very well. Jose D is in his 40s and got COVID-19 in fall 2020. He was between jobs and not insured at the time. He works as a healthcare executive and lives in a rural area in the Midwest. Jose traveled hours to receive care in an urban setting because, as a Hispanic and gay man, he had already experienced discrimination while seeking care and didn't feel safe continuing to do so once gravely ill. In this clip, he shares some of the reasons he sought care elsewhere. Is a, um, you know, it's a predominantly white Anglo um, demographic with a certain, um, you know, racial stigmas, racial uh, stereotypes, things like that. Um, I think in addition to that, I think one of the other things for me was being, you know, a gay male. And I think in that area as well, um, you know, same type of, you know, sort of stigmatization challenges, things like that. A hundred percent that there was no reservation that it was sort of felt like my health was 100% dependent on being in a diverse area or diverse providers um, where I wasn't a, you know, one in 100, you know, type of statistic, right? Susan is a white woman in her late 50s, works as a nurse, and lives alone in a small urban city. She contracted COVID in 2020 and has had lingering symptoms since. Since she was diagnosed early in the pandemic when much was unknown, several providers referred to her as a guinea pig. In this clip, Susan shares how that experience impacted her. So what was that like for you to hear from providers that you were a guinea pig that maybe they hadn't seen? seen to um, so I think that because there's so many unknowns, to have people that you want to kind of give you answers, call mm -hmm. you a pig, is really scary. I mean, I didn't, I wasn't offended by it really so because I understood it because being in the medical field, it's like, it's, it just was a reminder of, we don't know this thing is so messed up that we don't know what it's going to do to people. Jacqueline had COVID-19 twice in 2020 and experienced persisting symptoms both times. She is a Hispanic woman in her 30s, works in research while pursuing a master's degree, and lives in a large city. In this clip, Jacqueline reflects on how COVID has affected her and those in her community in relation to white friends and colleagues. I live in a low income to middle income neighborhood. And we are like this neighborhood is like the essential workers. And so I think that contributes to it as well. Like I always hate like separating things by like race and ethnicity. But for the lab that I work with, I'm pretty much the only minority. And of the entire group, I'm the only person who got COVID. I'm also the only person who knows several people who died from it, whose inner circle was affected by it, my friends. And sadly, a lot of my friends have long COVID symptoms. It makes me angry sometimes because all of these people are individuals who fall into like minority groups versus my white friends are not complaining of any of this. Sarah had severe COVID in 2021. Sarah is a 59-year-old white woman and mother living with her husband and dog in a small rural Midwestern community. Sarah's COVID-related symptoms persisted for over seven months. She has several underlying health conditions, but still was not prepared for the cognitive and emotional toll long COVID would take. In this clip, she talks about how much COVID has changed her sense of self. And the COVID was just the emotional and the physical and the mental part of it. I've always considered myself, I don't have my college 
college degree, but I always was good and succeeded at usually at everything. Good. And um, I don't feel like I'm me anymore. I have a lot to live for. Yeah. But it does play with your head. I'm usually a very strong willed person. And I actually feel rather weak. And I'm embarrassed when I run into people. Because I'm, I have trouble talking. It's just not who, who I am. Molly is a white woman in her 30s, works various jobs, including as an esthetician, and lives with her significant other in a rural community. She was diagnosed with COVID in 2020 and was on supplemental oxygen for months. Molly did not have insurance and was unable to work for months following her diagnosis. In this clip, Molly talks about the huge financial impact COVID had on her life. I was without um, any money for, you know, I think I went back to work part-time in November. So that would have been four, four months with any in, without any income coming in. Um, my friend started a GoFundMe page for me. Um, I did that. And then, you know, when that started to run out and I still wasn't able to work, um, I had applied for unemployment months and months before already and I got denied you're in a you know catch-22 you can't work to pay bills and you can't you know keep up on things Lily is a white woman in her 50s who lives alone in a large urban city and works in a bookstore she had COVID twice in 2020 and continues to experience symptoms, including disordered taste and smell. In this clip, Lily talks about how hard it is to speak about our lasting symptoms with others. Some of these things that are happening to me, I feel like, I sometimes I feel ridiculous trying to explain, I can't taste this or, um, some of the things that go haywire with my body just seem like something's got to be kidding. How, how is this even real? Like, I don't even believe in, so I almost feel like an unreliable narrator to myself or to others when I'm explaining them. Maddie was diagnosed with COVID in winter of 2020. She's a doctor and suspects she was infected at work. Maddie is in her early 40s and lives in a small city in the Midwest with her husband and children. In this clip, Maddie shares how COVID has impacted her life, but why she hesitates to share that with her providers. It annoys me when I can't help with something mm -hmm. as a healthcare provider, so I don't really want to like put my doctors in that position. But that's like totally, I have no idea if things can be done. It's a... It is, it's funny because here I am telling you how it's changed my life every day in so many ways. And then I'm saying it's not that important. But I think I'm telling myself it's not that important because I don't think there's anything that can be done. Tiffany was diagnosed with COVID-19 in the very early stages of the pandemic. She is in her late 20s, works in healthcare communications and research, and lives with her partner, baby, and dog in a large city in the Midwest. Here, Tiffany talks about the terms she came up with to describe her unique symptoms and how important it is to her that she and her doctor each learn from the other. Like I had hot lungs, I had sticky lungs. Um, and like, like also like a tightness. So sometimes I would feel like, like everything was like constricting. Um, sticky and hot is the worst combination in my opinion. Um, I appreciate that Dr. D uses my lung terminology when he is talking with me. I do feel like there is a transactional component to the learning. You know, he shares what he does know. He stays up on the science and the literature that comes out and that's clear to me in our appointments. He's also though like, 
I think like he really does approach it as that partnership and also like he I, I you know, I am someone that he is learning from. You know what I mean? Okay, so now you have heard um, directly from some of the people we interviewed, and we're going to spend some time now sort of sharing with you a larger synthesis of the very big volume of data we have for this pilot study and really emphasizing some of the themes that we hope will be helpful to all of you um, as you encounter people with long COVID in your daily lives and in your work. Many people we interviewed described how long COVID was leaving them, as we heard in the montage, feeling like, quote, less of who I am. There's so much feeling of the loss of thinking you're not going to get better and then the loss of who you were before you had COVID, said another person. I just want to be me. And I think it's hard, too. People ask me, why aren't you better yet? And that makes me feel like a failure. Life profoundly changed for a number of people we talked with. Routines at home with partners and children were disrupted. Treasured parts of daily life, like making art, cooking, or physical activities have been abandoned. Driving is, for some now, quote, super scary due to distractedness, brain fog, and forgetting to look in the rearview mirror. Work, as we heard a little bit in the montage, is affected for many people. I was cognitive that I was doing things wrong at work, said one person, but it's like I couldn't change it or control it, and then I would just shut down. And usually I get things done. I'm fierce. I'm a hard worker. That's the way I was raised. So I felt guilty, and I kept telling them, I'm not the person you hired. A number of people were forced to leave their jobs. I thought I was losing my mind, and I was ashamed of myself, said one in this situation. Another worried that the less she used her brain at work, the worse things would get. Yet she was unable to do the job she had before COVID. And though she got a lawyer, no suitable accommodation had yet been arranged at the time of our interview. People also wonder if their cognition will ever return to normal. A great many of those we interviewed signaled out brain fog and cognitive issues as huge and one of their biggest concerns. I don't know, said one, if I will ever be like as smart as I was, not to say that I was super brilliant, but I just feel a lot, lot less smart. People with long COVID are also adjusting to good physical health, no longer being there due to my fabulous day in the city. I mean, I felt fine. I couldn't even imagine the thought of the next day starting to not feel so great. So I reflect a lot on the fact that there's me before and me after. Doing what was easy before isn't so easy anymore. We were really healthy people. She says she should keep pushing through and maybe just maybe get back to where she was. Many people we interviewed spoke about how much changes to taste and smell, which are well-known sequelae, as Serena mentioned, impact their daily lives. Numerous of our interviewees talk about struggling to hide physical feelings of disgust when presented with meals they used to find delicious and they know were prepared for them with love. Other struggles include difficulty changing children's diapers, being around colleagues who are eating and using shampoos and soaps. We're also hearing a lot about living with the uncertainty of newly emerging health issues, as you heard a bit about in the montage. Interviewees talk about how difficult it can be to trust themselves. We heard about this from the participant who said she feels like an unreliable narrator, even to herself. Another person describes how she thought a whole array of symptoms from difficulty breathing to extreme fatigue. Had learned to doubt yourself a little bit that way after a while, she said. It's hard to trust in yourself and know what's real and what isn't. In the context of powerful self-doubt and wondering if long COVID is real or, quote, am I nuts, it matters a lot to be believed by others. Our interviewees also talked about how frightening it is to have a new and little understood condition. You heard one person in our montage talk about her experience being called a guinea pig. 
Others talk about feeling alarmed and frightened, quote, knowing what other neurological processes COVID could impair. Yeah, so um, just like being believed as an effective remedy for that self-doubt and not trusting yourself, so two reviewees emphasized how being accompanied through the long COVID landscape of uncertainty, particularly by clinicians, can bring relief. In the words of one respondent, with the uncertainty of this, that's got to be a hard one, a hard one on both ends of the equation for both clinicians and patients. For me, she continues, it's just addressing that outright is helpful. Another person also wishes she and her primary care provider could ride long together. Um, I'll just pick up just a, a second back. She would want that doctor to say, I don't know much about that, but I know some colleagues who are doing some work in this space. Let me get back to you and let's schedule a visit in a couple of weeks. Next slide. We interviewed a number of people who haven't sought primary care for their long COVID. So the interviews, as we as can often be the case, provide some insight about why patients may stay silent or stay away. Some were worried about risks for COVID and other germs associated with in-person visits. I felt so weak and fragile, said one. I didn't want to like contract anything. I didn't feel like going out and going into a building and indoors with other people, said another. I was scared to interact with others outside the world with everything going on. Stigma is another big issue. There's more people that are coming out about one of many interviewees who spoke about this, but it's such a stigma about the syndrome. So that has been a hard part of the journey. Others spoke about not disclosing their long COVID even to friends and family for many months and about how shocked people were when they eventually did find out. Hesitation about disclosing to primary care providers seems to have a few origins. In some instances, people were worried about being dismissed and others reluctant stemmed. As one person you may recall from the montage put it from quote, just feeling like there's not much that's known or can be done. It's scary to me, said one interviewee who had networked with many other long COVID sufferers. That stuff that people are not telling their doctors, but people are so frustrated with their health care, you know, health care systems not knowing what to do, that they just live at home with these symptoms. And that is, it's really sad. I think my primary hesitation is like thinking it's a waste of everyone's time, said another. We're also hearing a good bit of survivor's guilt. There has been so much death from COVID. Those who make it through may be reluctant to validate and get care for their own ongoing illness because they feel lucky by comparison. Especially right after COVID, said one person. I was in a very deep depression that was tough to get out of because for quite a long time, I never thought I'd be able to do the things I used to do. And that was hard to acknowledge because it's like, what do you have to be depressed about? You came out of it alive. You had COVID and it was like a cold, said another. Like, what the hell are you complaining about? So there's also this minimizing the impact because of the intense relief that we didn't die. Maybe that's why I'm like, I should suck it up. And I should think I have like a little bit of shame about like, don't complain. You were lucky to have survived COVID. Next slide. Our interviewees had what seemed to us like a good many actionable ideas for how connections around long COVID can grow stronger. I have time today to share just a few with you. Uh, one is a reminder that for patients, quote, just knowing someone is listening or cares or is checking in on you is huge and it can make such a difference for a person. And here's an explicit message to clinicians from one of our interviewees. I know that it's hard when they don't know that there's anything that they can do, but hopefully they listen and can even anecdotally pass along to another patient who says, you know, that they're suffering with a similar kind of thing. Don't just look at your patient as a collection of symptoms, says another, but really like listen to them and be that that chief detective and helping them figure out, you know, what could be COVID and what is just, nope, you're just getting old. While patients are intimately involved in the details of their own long COVID experiences, they are also aware that for an emerging condition, being able to learn at the population level is crucial. 
and they want clinicians and clinics to assure their long COVID gets counted. Quote, I so wish that there were data collected, said one. That there was more available to know how many of us there are, because you read about that, different people in the news. But in the whole realm of the world, or even the nation, or even the state, you know, I don't, I have no idea if we're in a minority or not. I think that that's something that I would really, really appreciate knowing. Another talked about collecting data in the EHR that would flag when heretofore unknown or little known symptoms are reported and allow for both aggregating up these patient reported experiences and also so, quote, if someone comes along, that will be notified. A third interview spoke about how legitimizing it was for her that her primary care physician specifically indicated post COVID syndrome on a referral he was making to specialists rather than just reporting one or two symptoms such as tachycardia. Patients hope to be connected through primary care to peer support and other community resources. Quote, support having someone in your practice. One of our interviewees suggested who wants you, who wants to, uh, who wants to know, do extra things to help people with long-term COVID. Don't chalk it up to mental illness, take people seriously and meet them where they are at. Like figure out where you can connect with them. Have quote, some sort of long haul liaison said another, a COVID Sherpa, somebody that can kind of drag you through. Here are things you can try. Here are things that are covered and just here are things not covered. Clinicians able to assist with getting benefits like short term disability or FMLA have been life altering for a few people we talked with quote people that know me know I would never want to go on disability. And that's like, I have applied for disability. My doctor said it would be better if I didn't have the pressure of trying to set a date when I can go and work again or get a new job. Another describes how her clinician filled out the FMLA paperwork for her and encouraged her to take time off when she needs it. And that made me feel like, okay, he gets it, she said, because he he's trusting. He says, I never say this to people, but with you, you need to take time. And when you feel badly, you need to use your FMLA. Next slide. Thank you so much for doing this. I know it's frustrating and there's so much we don't know, and I appreciate you doing this work and taking care of us and doing research to identify new treatments. And thank you for doing that work. Next slide. Thank you so much, Madison. I can pick up from there and um, because you didn't get to meet her at the beginning. <laughs> thank you, Madison Wynn. Um, she's a researcher um, in the department, uh, brilliant scholar and um, has a background in public health. Thank you so much, Madison, for um, for picking up there. But we uh, are still looking for people to interview, like some of the ones that you heard in the montage. Um, we're particularly, as you saw in some of our demographic information, particularly missing um, some perspectives from people who are um, non-white. We've interviewed mostly women, um, which sort of matches the epidemiological landscape of long COVID, um, but also looking for people who identify as LGBTQ. Um, and so if, if anyone has any, any people they know who might be interested, um, we'd be very happy for them to get in touch with us. So looking ahead a little bit from this work, we are working on some, some various grant writing to look towards building a full scale web-based module for long COVID as we have with um, other conditions on health experiences, USA.org. Um, interested in, in thinking about translating patient and community knowledge for care improvement, um, how we can start to use some of these, intervent these narratives to build interventions in clinical settings that really center patients' perspectives and some of the actionable ideas that, that you've started to hear today. And then understanding more about this landscape of long COVID advocacy and mobilization, um, particularly the ways that that is intersecting with uh, social justice work and um, attention to health inequities. So a lot of directions moving forward. And I'll turn it back to Serena. Okay, so um, what can we do? I think um, one of the more powerful voices in the montage was that of um, a physician who was saying, 
you know, I just haven't been telling my clinician, my PCP about it because I know there's nothing for them to do. Um, all of us want to be able to help people, um, but we don't have a lot of tools um, in uh, the arsenal to treat these long haul symptoms. So I kind of put this picture, the power of primary health care, and this is the way I, I envision how we um, meet people with long COVID where they are and help them move forward. Um, I put a citation in this slide, um, a review article that came out in the Journal of American Board of Family Medicine. Um, it's it's, a, it's an overview of long COVID symptoms. Um, and I thought they did a pretty good job, but but the majority of that paper is talking about ruling out anything else, like people with chest pain, making sure they don't have um, cardiac issues, people with shortness of breath, making sure they don't have you know, pneumonia or COPD or, you know, post-viral bronchospasm. So there's not a lot um, about the actual um, symptoms related to the virus. Um, one thing that we can do is work on our relationship. So this is actually super powerful, you know, telling people we believe them, putting it in their diagnosis list, um, saying, you know, we can be honest and saying we don't know what to do, but I'm going to be with you the whole time and we'll continue to to spend time together and every, you know, I'm reading about this, everything that comes out. Um, and if I find something, you're the first person I'm going to call. So I think that idea of establishing the relationship, making sure that you're a team, naming the symptoms, obviously ruling out secondary causes. There are some symptomatic treatments that might be helpful. Um, uh, identifying community support resources and then maintaining follow up and a team approach to care um, tend to be really important. So just thinking back to our um, patient that we started out with, Valerie, her main complaints were fatigue, lack of concentration and decreased smell and taste. Um, so that's sort of a daunting list. Uh, you know, things you could think about talking to her about. Yes, she can't taste, but that's not, we don't want her losing weight because she can't taste. If she wants, you know, so thinking about um, protein supplements, bland foods so that there's not this disconnect with what the food's supposed to taste like and what it does taste like. Um, you know, as far as the fatigue, um, really talking to her and, and other people about maintaining their um, energy levels. I know a lot of people with fibromyalgia talk about the they have a bucket and so they have a finite amount of energy every day and they have to really think clearly and um, specifically about what they want to expend that energy on. So, so you know, if somebody doesn't have a lot of energy, we can coach them a little bit on really focusing on spending their energy on things that are really important and not wasting it on other things. Um, as far as the concentration, you know, it's, um, we can talk to people about tricks. So if you're forgetting words, if you're forgetting names, you know, um, write things down, make lists, keep really good notes, have a calendar, maybe have, if you're in a meeting with people and you're worried you're going to forget their names, print out their pictures and write their names next to it so that you can have that in front of you. So sort of, a, again, a lot of these are not sort of medical interventions, but they may be helpful suggestions for people to um, mitigate some of these symptoms. Yeah, we just wanted to wrap up with a huge thank you to um, all of the participants who shared their stories with us, um, to our team members, Madison, who you've now met, um, but also Brianna Patrick, who put together the beautiful montage of um, the clips from the interview. So very big thank you to Brianna for that. Um, and then the wonderful colleagues at, at REN and the department for funding this work. And with that, we'd like to open it up for your questions and comments. Wonderful. Uh, thank you all so much. And so we'll go into the, the Q&A part. Um, yeah, I would echo and also I think Matt put this in the comments. That was very uh, powerful uh, video and really appreciate all of the people that participated in that and sharing their stories. Um, 
a comment or a question, um, maybe for Dr. Schrager, um, what are the statistics surrounding children affected by long COVID? Or Dr. Edward, yeah. Yeah, so I haven't seen great prevalence data, but it does happen. And because children have usually have less symptomatic acute infections, um, the long symptoms can happen after minimal symptoms or sometimes even people not knowing they had the acute infection. But I have not seen any good like studies of, of prevalence. Okay. And uh, next question, um, I think this also sounds like it's a stigma in different ways, different layers, but I have a patient who has prolonged symptoms after the second vaccine, so she does not want more vaccines. Is there any data on this? And um, the symptoms uh, are mainly fatigue. And then she's now being shunned from her dance class due to not being vaccinated. So obviously causing some tension. So I guess the question about oh. vaccine related symptoms for long COVID. I mean, I can, I can start with that. And I, I think, you know, um, people can certainly get long-term symptoms from vaccines. It's probably a different mechanism because you're not, you're not infected with the virus, but it does stimulate your immune system. So the, the symptoms that people are getting is from, um, you know, a um, activation of their immune system, which I think is is really important to clarify because that can happen with any vaccine theoretically. Um, maybe this is me the party line, but I encourage everybody to get fully vaccinated. And um, you know, I I think this is a, a discussion that we could have this. Um, shaming people for making personal health decisions. It's there have been um, it's a it's a tough place that we are in as a society because we have preventive me measures and we're judging people who choose not to take those preventive measures. Just to add briefly to that, the um, National Academies of Science, Engineering, and Medicine had over the past uh, two days a forum on long COVID, um, and one of the questions that came up in that space was around these people that have possible lingering symptoms from the vaccine, whether they are able to seek the same sorts of care at specialty long COVID clinics, um, and sort of who is eligible for that care. So that is is another thing that it seems like. Um, centers all over the country are sort of contending with of where the, the boundaries are for some of these hard to address and, and hard to describe symptoms. <clears throat> and the next question um, has to do with the uh, participants in the study. Um, have participants let you know if and how they want to learn about the results of your, your research? Can take that unless Rachel, your audio is is back on. But I'm a little bit afraid to try. So you can go ahead. <laughs> okay. um, so uh, yes, it's a wonderful question, and we do very much um, build relationships with people and keep in touch with them um, so that they can can let us know, you know, what and in what form they're interested in learning about um, what we find in these. In in some of the results of the research, um, we are doing some grant writing right now and involving a couple of the people that we interviewed as advisors on those projects um, as a way of um, sort of keeping keeping relationships going uh, and very interested in different ways of packaging the findings um, to share with different audiences and definitely um, people with long COVID, including the people that we interviewed, are are one of those audiences for sure. And also along those lines, are there opportunities for peer support um, ongoing within the group that you were, you know, participated or just, you know, any peer support opportunities in Madison or, you know, virtual organizations doing this? Yeah, there's certainly um, a number of sort of long COVID communities that 
that cropped up on social media and some larger groups that are now um, driving research agendas and and really mobilizing around um, some of the the establishment of care guidelines and things like that. In terms of our own project there, I don't believe there's any um, sort of formal ongoing support, but definitely something that seems to be of interest as as you heard in our presentation to people with long COVID. Um, I don't know, Dr. Schreier, if there's there's any resources you know of at the at UW. Um, no, I do not know. Uh, the next uh, question um, has to do um, with you know, the prevalence of women and in terms of both in the massage and then also um, what we know about long COVID. Um, so any data on men um, and long COVID symptoms? Um, is it a different, is the same symptoms, it, um, prevalence, et cetera? Yeah, so um, completely right that it does seem to be more in women, um, whether that's physiologically or, or reported. Um, we did interview a few men for this study and um, symptom profiles were very similar, um, sort of the same different symptoms developing over time and um, a lot of uncertainty over 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 symptoms. I think, oh, can I just add that I yes, the, sure. the large studies don't show a different prevalence, which is mm. makes this so interesting that most of the people who volunteered for this study were women. Uh, in terms of, you know, I know a number of healthcare organizations are establishing either multidisciplinary clinics or um, resources. Has UW Health established a central resource? to help coordinate care facility benefits and identify peer support groups? So there is a long COVID clinic run by one of the infectious disease um, doctors, um, Aurora Popvicus. I do not know whether they have support groups. Um, and I, I think, you know, a lot of places around the country there's that question of who, who owns this work. Um, you know, it it sort of has landed a little bit in ID just because it's related to a virus. But um, I, for a lot of places, it probably makes more sense to be in a primary care office where um, you have more comprehensive um, relationships and and longitudinal relationships. Great. And their um, next uh, question is regarding more kind of policy and, uh, you know, looking at um, is, you know, how is this work supporting the changes needed within payer systems? Um, and um, Dr. Grob has started the conversation, the answer, um, and it sounds like there is a fellow, um, the student that's going to be working on this precise issue this summer. Um, We'll be going upstream for our study data to look at the policy issues and hoping that um, the primary data can assist with needed changes um, in the payers. Um, we have uh, one request to briefly show the slide in regards to the research question or purpose of the study. So um, as we uh, try to advertise it within clinics. Yeah, if you get in touch with us, um, I think we're all easily findable in the department. We can also send copies of that flyer to you. We have IRB permission to do uh, to do this form of recruitment. Do you have it in Spanish? That is a good question. I don't believe we do. Um, Who's speaking? Patricia. Patricia. Yeah, let, let's talk afterwards about that. We have we have probably more to say on that than we can say in the one minute we have left. We would love to interview people in Spanish. Um, but we it's a it's a longer conversation. Great. 
All right. Well, we're coming up right to the hour, and I think a good way to end is again, you know, please reach out um, if you have patients that may be interested in the in the study. Uh, really powerful again um, presentation uh, and uh, but such an important timely topic. And thank you all so much uh, for participating. I uh, really appreciate it. Thanks, Melissa. Thanks, Melissa. Thanks, everyone.